Beginning uh, this Sunday and carrying into the fall, we will be embarking on a series of studies centered on Jesus' Sermon on the, on the Mount. And I believe that this, is, this series is timely in light of Pastor Jim's brief study through the month of June on the end times, things to come. As you may recall, <clears throat> we were taught from the scriptures that the next big key event of our Lord's return is the resurrection and the rapture of his church. The forthcoming messages over the coming weeks dealing with Christ's sermon are timely in light of Christ's soon coming because they serve to prepare us as believers in and disciples of Christ Jesus to live lives ready to meet the Lord in the air when he comes. The title Sermon on the Mount was originally coined by St. Augustine some 1600 years ago, and of course it's stuck ever since. The reason he named it the Sermon on the Mount is obvious, for it's found in the very first verse of chapter 5, seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain. It was delivered from the top of this hillside in Galilee that he delivered his famous sermon. The sermon is recorded by Matthew in chapters 5, 6, and 7 of his gospel. The preacher, the teacher, is Jesus of Nazareth. It's the longest recorded sermon preached publicly by Jesus in all the gospels. A shorter version of a similar sermon given by our Lord on a level plain in Galilee is found in Luke's gospel in chapter 6. There's some similarities between the two sermons, but there are also many differences. It's important to remember that Luke's record was written principally for the benefit of the Gentiles, while Matthew's gospel was written principally for the benefit of the Jews. Nevertheless, the account in Matthew's gospel is every bit applicable to us today and is as important to us as it was to those gathered around the hillside to hear Jesus on that day. It's a short read. It takes anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes to read, depending on how fast or slow one reads through it. Many commentators believe that the actual sermon was much longer in length and that Matthew takes the longer sermon and underscores it in abbreviated points depicting the essence of life and practice of the members of the kingdom of heaven while they are alive here on this earth. Many commentators and preachers have written and said that the Sermon on the Mount was preached by the greatest preacher who ever preached. It is perhaps the one section of scripture most referenced and most often quoted by believer and unbeliever alike, often to support beliefs and defenses apart from the meaning of the Lord's own intent. John Stott in the introductory to his commentary wrote these words, the Sermon on the Mount is probably the best known part of the teaching of Jesus, though arguably it is the least understood and certainly it's the least obeyed. It is the nearest thing to a manifesto that he ever uttered, for it is his own description of what he wanted his followers to be and to do. Plymouth Brethren writer William Kelly had one of the best assessments of the sermon. This is what he had to say. The Sermon on the Mount treats not of salvation, but of the nature, character, and conduct of those who belong to Christ, the true yet rejected King. And I think that Kelly was correctly summarized Jesus' sermon because it, literally, it is literally impossible for the natural man to fill any, let alone all, of the demands of his teachings. Only one who is born by and filled with his spirit has the supernatural ability not just to hear Jesus' words regarding moral and ethical principles of his kingdom, but more importantly, the power to act upon those words. The sermon can be outlined in basically three points. Uh, three very simple and uh, three very simple points. One. The first section is the people of the kingdom are described in Matthew 5, 3 to 16. Then in sec the secondly, the righteousness of the kingdom is prescribed from Matthew 5, 17 all the way through to Matthew 7, verse 12. And it's made up of 17 subpoints dealing with both the inner character and outer co conduct 
of a member of the kingdom of heaven. And then the third part, the last section, Matthew 7, 13 to 29, are you inside or outside the kingdom? And Jesus uses three metaphors to depict whether a person is inside or outside the kingdom. Two trees, two houses, uh, two gates, two trees, and two houses. There are four differing views on the sermon, basically four different views teaching in the sermon that have been put forward over the centuries. First of all, a social view to be imposed. This view embraces the sermon, but believes that Christ's ethic can be realized in the world without possessing the power and the life of Christ in, in a person to live it. It teaches that man on his own, in his natural estate, can accomplish all that Christ demands of him in the sermon. And it tries to impose the moral ethic of Jesus on an unbelieving world without first having the power of Jesus to live it. It believes that man is basically good and righteous, overlooking the sinful nature in man, which must first be dealt with before it ever becomes possible to begin to live out the ethic of the sermon by the power of the Holy Spirit living within. It tends to treat the atonement of Christ for sin on the cross as far less important and secondary to the ethic demanded of Christ in his sermon, which is impossible for man in his natural sinful condition to even come close to fulfilling. The second view is an irrelevant view to be discarded. This view treats the sermon as being so impossible to live up to and to obey in all of its dimensions that it is to be discarded as irrelevant. This view treats Jesus' teachings as another form of legalism, and because the believer is said to be no longer under the law, Christ's teachings and commands therefore can be totally disregarded. They don't dismiss the gospel of salvation as, irre as irrelevant, but they treat the life in the kingdom of heaven as prescribed by Christ as irrelevant. But you cannot have one without the other. A true believer and follower of Christ will embrace both. This view often ends up treating the gospel of God's grace as a license to sin. And then a third view is a future view to be realized. There is a third view that has become somewhat popular over recent years. It states that because of the high demands of the sermon, it must not be relevant to today's world, not even for the believer. Those who hold to this view believe that the sermon must be applicable to some future world, the millennial. However, the teachings of our Lord in his sermon deal with the realities of life in this world where we live and breathe and conduct our lives today in this age and in this world. And then the fourth view, the correct view I believe, is the present view to be embraced. This view believes that Jesus was serious in all of his teachings in the sermon and that it was meant to be taken seriously by all who hear it and read it and study it. This view believes that incorporated within the gospel of God, God has given us not only salvation from our sins, but also his divine power to be able to live a godly life as instructed by Jesus in his sermon. Those who hold to this view believe that what Christ commands, he supplies the power to enable the disciple to follow and obey. And 2 Peter chapter, three, uh, chapter 1 verse 3 says this, His divine power, God's divine power, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. In other words, the more we get to know him, the more we become like him. And the only way we can become like him, of course, is to know him through the word, through prayer, and through fellowship with one another. This morning, we're going, as we enter into the study, we're only going to cover the first two verses of Matthew chapter 5, and I've entitled it, Matthew's Prelude to Christ's Sermon. First of all, there's the setting to the sermon. In Matthew 4, it all actually starts in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. And when Matthew wrote this, of course, he didn't, didn't divide it into chapters and verses, but it was just a narrative, a, a straight narrative. So going back to verse 23 of chapter 4, it says, 
The news about him, that's Christ, spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And the question is, well, why did Jesus deliver the sermon? The text says that, or where did Jesus deliver the sermon? The text says that he went up on the mountain. Matthew doesn't tell us what mountain, but we know that it was in Galilee where he started his ministry. This sermon was delivered very early on in his ministry and the crowds gathered in to see him. But the question is, well, why a mountain? And there's two reasons, a practical earthly reason and a heavenly reason. First of all, a practical earthly reason. Some scholars claim that he did this in order for the large crowd of people to hear him. The surrounding mountains would have acted as an echo chamber, resounding his voice and his words as he spoke them. Charles Spurgeon introduces this section with these words. For retirement, fresh air, and wide open space, the king seeks a hillside. Of course, this would be mainly because of the accommodation which the open hillside would afford to the people, and the readiness with which upon some jutting crag of stone the preacher might sit down and be both heard and seen. Notice the phrase, seeing the crowds, he went up. From this, we see Jesus' interest in and his heart for people in general, from all walks of life, from all kinds of backgrounds and histories. Unlike the religious leaders of his day who tended to separate themselves from the common people, Jesus mingled with people, with all kinds of people. In his ministry, he rejected no one, but ministered to all. Verse 25 of chapter 4 not only reflects the interest of people in him, but verse 1 of chapter 5 reflects Jesus' interest in them. He saw the crowds, and in order to minister to all of them, he went up to the top of a hillside to deliver a powerful and potentially life-changing message to them. And his purpose was to tell them what a person in the kingdom of heaven is like. And in him, they had the genuine, authentic reality. Then there's a second reason <clears throat> that he went up to the mountain, a spiritual heavenly reason. It's interesting that Jesus spoke to this crowd from a mountain or from the peak of a high hillside. And he spoke to the crowds directly and authoritatively in commands and laws from a position on high as king. Just as the law was delivered through Moses on Mount Sinai, so the deeper meaning and requirements of the law were given by Jesus from this mountaintop in Galilee. The crowds at Mount Sinai heard the law and responded in great fear and trembling. But here we see the crowds coming to Jesus and gathering around him without fear, in peace and at rest. Charles Spurgeon wrote this of the spiritual significance of the setting. It was suitable that such elevated ethics should be taught from on high. A natural hill suited his truthful teaching better than a pulpit of marble would have done. Mountains have always been associated with distinct eras in the history of the people of Israel. Mount Sinai is sacred to the law. Calvary was also in due time to be connected with redemption and the Mount of Olives with the ascension of our risen Lord. Thank God it was not a mount around which fences and bounds had to be placed. It was not the mount which burned with fire from which Israel retired in fear. It was doubtless a mountain all carpeted with grass and dainty with fair flowers upon whose side the olive and the fig flourished in abundance, save the rocks jutting upward through the sod, which eagerly invited their Lord to honor them by making them his throne and his pulpit. Beautiful picture, isn't it? Second point I want to make is the posture of the teacher. And look at what it further says in Matthew 5, 1b. And after he sat down, 
Notice that Jesus sat down to speak. This speaks not only of a posture of relaxation, but it also speaks of the posture of judgment. This speaks of two things that I see about Jesus. Number one, it signifies his humanity. He sat down before the people, signifying that he was one of them and revealing a comfort that people could have in coming to him in the fellowship that they could have with him. He was one of them in his humanity, the one to whom they could come and find rest and fellowship in his company, the one to whom they could come freely to listen to and from whom to learn. Secondly, it also signifies his divinity, his divine authority. He sat down before the people at the height of the hillside in his supreme majesty as king and judge. The crowds looked up and saw him seated on high. It would not be a mistake for them to see him in his divine authority and regard him as the Messiah, the very Son of God sent from heaven as king and judge. And it's worth noting that in Matthew 7.21, Jesus refers to God as my Father in heaven. And this comes in the context of his divine authority on equal footing with God as judge and king on the day of God's judgment on the disobedient and rebellion. The only place it's found in the sermon where he calls God my Father. It's also interesting to note that through the sermon and speaking to his disciples, Jesus refers to God as your father in heaven a total of some 16 times. Only once he does he refer to God as our father in the Lord's prayer, our father who art in heaven in Matthew 6, 7. But only once in the sermon does he refer to God exclusively as my father in heaven and it is in the context of his divine power and authority as king and as judge. Thirdly, the audience of the preacher is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1c. And it says, And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. There are two groups mentioned, both classed as followers. In chapter 4, verse 25, Matthew states that large crowds followed him. And then in chapter 5, verse 1, Matthew records that his disciples came to him. Out of the crowds of people assembled that day on the hillside, Matthew stresses the point that Jesus' disciples came to him. Up to this point in Matthew's gospel account, we know of only four disciples whom Jesus called, Peter, James, John, and Andrew. No doubt there were others not specifically mentioned by name. But why would Matthew highlight this in his record? It seems that this group in particular is mentioned because what Jesus was about to reveal in his sermon was really intended only for disciples of Jesus. There were countless numbers who followed Jesus on that day, but out of the many, Matthew saw only a limited number who came near to Jesus and as such, he referred to them as Christ's disciples. It was this group who were there not merely because of the miraculous works that he was doing and the benefit that they could gain temporarily and worldly, although they may have all, that may have well drawn their attention to him, but who were there because they wanted to hear him and to learn from him and to know him intimately at the deepest level and to follow him as their Lord and Master. There's no question that the crowds heard Jesus that day, for after he finished speaking, Matthew notes that the crowds were astonished at his teaching, Matthew 7, 28. But according to what Matthew observes, it seems that Jesus was particularly interested in those who were serious in their desire to learn from him. For after making reference to the disciples in verse 1, he states in verse 2, he opened his mouth and taught them saying, and then this is in direct reference to those disciples who came to them when he says them. It may be true that some in the crowds did become disciples afterwards, but at the time of the delivery of this sermon, those who came near to Jesus to learn from him were considered by Matthew as disciples of Jesus. And then fourthly, the delivery by the preacher 
And the text says in verse 2 of chapter 5, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying. Notice that Matthew is very detailed and meticulous in observing and recording Jesus' every action to the point of even watching the movement of the lips of Jesus' mouth. <laughs> this, I believe, is no little thing to be glossed over. And there are two ways to consider this observation of Matthew that he records in his account. First of all, a practical way. Jesus spoke to the crowds orally, verbally, in a voice that could be heard with all the inflections and tones of speech as he turned a phrase, and with all the emphasis and convictions of his thoughts as, as he expressed those thoughts in words, in words that the crowds could hear and in words that they could understand. So effective was he in his speech that after Jesus finished speaking, Matthew tells us this, and when Jesus had finished these, when he wrote his gospel account, saw the words coming from Jesus' mouth as being on the same level with God, God breathed. The words that Jesus spoke to the crowds that day ought to be richly taken in as words coming from who he truly is, very God of very God. The words of this sermon are indeed the words of God. But the question then comes, well, why study this sermon on the, on the mount? And there are basically four reasons that I've come up with. Number one it indeed points to the sinfulness in man. The sermon points to the sinfulness in man and how far we fall short of the glory and the excellence of God. It points to our absolute need for forgiveness by God. The Sermon on the Mount may seem to encourage God's righteousness in man apart from Christ, but in fact it brings conviction and condemnation for, failing, for falling way short of God's standard of righteousness in order to stand before him. Secondly, it points to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the author of the sermon, and we need to study it to become well acquainted with him. The preacher of the Sermon on the Mount is the Sermon on the Mount. And the sermon brings us face to face with the person and the nature of our Lord. If we want to know Jesus Im intimately and become more like him in our character and conduct, this sermon is a go good place to go to on a regular basis. Thirdly, it shows the believer the way to please our Heavenly Father. It's true that we cannot please Him until we first become a member of His family. That only comes with the new birth through faith in Christ. But once we are in His family, it's a privilege and ought to be our greatest desire to please Him and a joy to know that He is pleased with us. And the sermon points us to ways that the child of God can do that. I remember a few years ago listening to David Jeremiah. And his, he told a story about his daughter being invited out with some friends. And he told her that he, she had to be back at home by 10 o'clock. And anyway, as the evening wore on, the uh, crowd she was with uh, decided they were going to stay out past 10. But she said, no, I've got to go home. And uh, they were, of course, they were wondering, well, why? And he said, because I want to please my dad. And I think this goes for us, too, when we come to the sermon. One of the reasons we read it and study it is to know how to please our Heavenly Father. And finally, <clears throat> it points to the way of blessing as Christians. Here the believer finds the way to true peace and eternal satisfaction for the soul, not in, not in accordance with the temporal understanding and standards of the world, but in accordance with the principles found in these words of Christ. In praying, studying, and applying this sermon from heaven to our lives as believers, the richest blessings from God on high are ours to have to the fullest. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, Lord, and thank you that as we embark on this study of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, on the Mount that as believers, Father, these instructions and teachings are ours to richly embrace. <clears throat>
to learn and to understand and to follow through. Father, we know that we are weak vessels and we need your power to help us in that life. But thank you, Lord, that through Christ, we are members of your kingdom. And in this sermon, we find ways, Lord, to please you. We give you thanks for this morning, Lord, and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.